Uh, on behalf of the Lowell Lecture Humanities Series, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's reading. I'm Eileen Donovan Kranz, a member of the English Department, and I'm honored to introduce you to the award-winning novelist Jennifer Haig. Here are a few things you might like to know. She is indeed the granddaughter of Western Pennsylvanian coal miners. She writes in longhand at her Ukrainian grandmother's kitchen table. A transplant to Boston South Shore, she prefers gray off-season days, she says, to the sunny summer ones. She teaches just a tea ride away in BU's creative writing program. But I do hope that tonight BC sprung for the cab. <laughs> Here are a few other things about Jennifer Haig. Her first novel, Mrs. Kimball, 2001, is the tale of a devilish serial monogamer, Ken Kimball, and the three wives who successively find themselves wooed and once married, underwhelmed by him. This first novel, in a process Haig has called lightning quick and painless, soon won an agent, a publisher, and then the Penn Hemingway Award for Outstanding First Fiction. Her second novel is Baker Towers. The towers refer not to a glamorous urban high rise and its wealthy inhabitants, but to a, the 40 foot tall slag heaps that mark the fictional mining town of Bakerton. This novel is a sweeping exploration of a large West Pennsylvania mining family and the changing fate of their lives and their town in the years during and after World War II. It did not disappoint winning Haig the Penn L.L. Winship Award in 2006. But like most overnight successes, Haig had actually bided her time. She attended the I.O. Writers Workshop, but not right after college. It really would have been a disaster, she once said, to go at 21. Instead, she says she did everything, including teaching, some writing, and many ordinary jobs. She became a magazine editor eventually, but did not quit magazine work to write her first novel until she turned that pivotal age of 30. Haig had begun Mrs. Kimball, in fact, before attending the Iowa workshop, and she finished it there in 2001. Reviewers have called her work mythic, hypnotic, and pitch perfect. Her work in Baker Towers has garnered many comparisons. Part Zola, part John O'Hara, writes one. Somewhere between Oates and Updike Country, writes another. Pick up the book yourself, and you will understand why. The novel is contemporary, with evocative writing and brief episodes, it moves daringly forward in time and between a family of characters. Yet the sweep and scope of the novel places her among 19th century novelists as well. In reading Baker Towers, I thought, she's not going to show the whole life of this whole family, is she? But in short, she does. Haig's ambition, she says, is to show in a novel how people's lives turn out. In doing so, Haig transmits to us the thoughts and words and worlds of people who are otherwise gone and lost. Perhaps this preoccupation stems from her roots. Tellingly, the West Pennsylvanian coal town in which she was raised no longer exists. In a brief essay about the merger of that town, Barnesboro, with others, she has written, people don't forget, they simply go. We remember Barnesboro, and in that way, it will live, but only as long as we do. But through the novel Baker Towers, Haig has achieved a magical thing. The fictional Bakerton does live. Tonight, in this reading about and lecture about bringing place, and I have to say people, to life, you'll see how. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Haig to Boston College. Wow, thank you for that terrific introduction. Um, I'm so delighted to be here at BC this evening as part of the Lowell Humanities series. Um, well, as you have heard, um, I am a novelist, also a short story writer. My first two books uh, were published by HarperCollins in the last few years, and I'm now at work on a third novel, which, if it doesn't kill me, will be finished sometime next year. Tonight, I'm going to talk mostly about my second novel, Baker Towers, and how that book came about. I thought I'd talk a little and then read a little, and then afterwards I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, either about Baker Towers, about Mrs. Kimball, my first novel, or about the writing process in general. Um, I've learned from painful experience that it's good to give an audience some warning about this question and answer period, um, because the first time I did a talk like this, nobody said anything. 
And I sat there for a really long time until finally, a little old lady in the first row raised her hand and asked very timidly, what do writers do all day? Which is actually a very good question and something I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but for right now, this book, Baker Towers, is a family story set in a little coal mining town in western Pennsylvania. Um, as you've heard, it focuses on one family, the Novaks, a family with five children who come of age during World War II. The oldest son in the family, George, serves on a Navy minesweeper in the South Pacific. Uh, his sister Dorothy gets a wartime job in Washington, D.C. at the Department of the Treasury, and another sister, Joyce, enlists in the Women's Air Force. But the main character in this book is really Bakerton, the town where the story takes place. Bakerton is a coal town. Its streets are lined with identical company houses, each with three rooms upstairs and three rooms downstairs. The houses are owned by the Baker Brothers Mining Company, which employs nearly every man in the town. And in the opening chapters of the book, the mines are booming. You can tell this by the growth of the two towers, which, as you've heard, are two rock piles on the outskirts of town. As the book opens, the towers are 40 feet high and growing, graceful slopes of loose coal and sulfurous dirt. The towers give off an odor like struck matches. On windy days, they glow soft orange like the embers of a campfire. Scrap coal spontaneously combusting, a million bits of coal bursting into flame. The mines are not named after Bakerton. Bakerton is actually named after the mines. And that's a very important distinction. It, it really explains the order of things in this world. I wrote Baker Towers in about three years, but I'd been thinking about it for much longer than that. Writers are always asked how we choose our subjects. And in this case, I'm not sure if I chose it at all. I think it was given to me. It's the kind of happy accident that only happens to a writer once in a lifetime, if, if you're lucky. In fact, I was born and raised in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania. My town, uh, Barnesboro, was home to maybe 5,000 people, um, and now actually has many fewer than that. At its peak, um, Barnesboro had four traffic lights, uh, a great many churches, and a whole lot of bars. You could drive through the center of town in about 20, 25 seconds, and that's if you observe the speed limit. And it was the sort of place that uh, doesn't get written about. For a long time, I did not find that fact particularly surprising. When I was a teenager living in Barnesboro, I would have described it as a place where nothing ever happens. I remember feeling as though I must have done something really bad in a past life to have be stuck growing up in a place like this. When I was growing up in Barnesboro, the town struck me as so ordinary. For one thing, everybody I knew had coal miners in the family, and at the time I thought this was an unremarkable way to earn a living. I was an adult before I really thought about what coal miners actually do on their shifts. My grandfather was a pinner. That means he was the first man to enter a shaft of coal after the blasters had been through. His job was to crawl into the hole and hammer in a series of wooden posts to hold up the ceiling, which was usually no more than three feet high. Now above his head were thousands of tons of coal and rock, enough to crush him and his entire crew in a couple of seconds. Now, aside from the physical danger of this job, think about the sense of confinement those men must have felt, the physical discomfort of working on your hands and knees for 10 hours straight, and of course, working in darkness. It seems incredible to me now that I ever thought this was an ordinary way of making a living. Everything about it is extraordinary. When I set out to write this book, Baker Towers, 
I knew it would be important to create a sense of place, that unique texture of living in a coal mining town. I didn't think it'd be hard. I'd lived most of my life in a town like that, so I thought, hey, this will be the easy part. In fact, I was wrong. The one piece of advice young writers are always given is to write what we know. The argument goes something like this. The more familiar your subject, the less you'll have to invent, and the easier the writing process will be. Now, anytime I follow this advice, the results are disastrous. For instance, if I try to write about people I know, my friends and family, I find that my imagination shuts down completely. My brother, for example, is so familiar to me, his personality is so distinct, that I would never be able to turn him into a character. I just can't imagine my brother stealing a car or getting thrown in jail or doing anything he wouldn't actually do in life. In fact, the only way I could use him in my fiction would be to write about him exactly as he is. And my brother's an accountant. For the federal government, yet. This is just not good material for fiction. And there's also the guilt factor. Characters in novels experience a tremendous amount of bad luck. They get sick, they go bankrupt, they lose the family farm, they go bald, they despair, and then they drop dead. Now, how could I inflict this kind of pain on people I know? I, the guilt would just kill me. It's much, much easier for me to heap misfortune on invented people. I found that the same was true for my hometown. The town in Baker Towers experiences some very traumatic times. The mines falter, accidents happen, people lose their jobs, the coal mining industry goes downhill. How could I do that to my hometown? The answer was I couldn't. I discovered that I was so attached to Barnesboro, my town, and I had such intimate knowledge of it that I simply couldn't make anything up. Whenever I tried, a little censor inside me would say, Jennifer, you can't write that. That's not the way it happened. So instead of setting my novel in Barnesboro, Pennsylvania, I had to invent a whole new town. The Bakerton in my book is kind of a composite of many different mining towns, I remember. I chose the name Bakerton first because I like the sound of it, and second because it ties the town to the mining company. My hometown, Barnesboro, was named for the Barnes and Tucker Mines, and my imaginary Bakerton is named for the Baker Brothers Company, whose mines also are the lifeblood of that town. And because my Bakerton was imaginary, I had absolute control over the landscape. This was very important. I controlled the history, the geography. For the purposes of my story, I needed an Italian church, a baseball field, a railroad station, and a bowling alley. Now, I didn't have to dig around and find a town in western Pennsylvania that had all four of those things in 1956. I just made them up. I wanted to write a scene at a diner, followed by one in front of the fire hall. So I just put those two buildings across the street from each other, instead of making my characters get into a car and drive around town. It sounds like a small detail, but these are the things novelists worry about. Virginia Woolf once said famously that she spent her whole day trying to get her characters to cross the room. And that's exactly right. In Baker Towers, I was trying to get my characters across town. I knew, I had always known that I would have to set my novel during World War II. The 40s and 50s were a terrific time in coal mining country. The mines were booming, there was a job for anybody who wanted one, and people were having a good time. Now, I know this not because I experienced any of it, I didn't, but because my whole life I'd been hearing people talk about it. That Barnesboro, the firemen's festivals, the dances at the Legion and the Vets, bore no resemblance to the Barnesboro I grew up in, which by the 1980s was a pretty depressed and frankly depressing kind of place. I was a kid when things began to change in my town. Coal production had always been a cyclical thing, so slowdowns, 
were nothing new. But the slowdown that happened in the 70s and 80s was entirely different. There were new environmental regulations, first of all, which meant that bituminous coal was suddenly too dirty to burn. And the steel industry, which was the biggest consumer of Western Pennsylvania coal, was having its own problems. For the first time, steel was not being produced in Pittsburgh. It was being imported from Germany and Japan. I was just a child when the mines started to slide. I was too young to understand really what was happening or why. But I do remember in elementary school, I used to get a new pair of sneakers every September to wear to school. And one September, I think I was in the sixth grade, I went to school and found I was the only kid with a new pair of sneakers. There had been a United Mine Workers strike that year, and the mines were shut down for two or three months. And nearly every kid in my class had a father out of work. Now, my dad was a school teacher, so the strike didn't affect us in the same way, but I was so ashamed of those new sneakers. I was absolutely mortified. I, as you heard, I teach in the graduate creative writing program down the road at BU, and one bit of advice I always give to my own students is to write about the moment when everything changes. And that's what I tried to do in Baker Towers. I wanted to show what happened to my town, how the people of Barnesboro went from dancing at the Legion to waiting in line for those big blocks of Reagan-era free government cheese. That's my childhood. I wanted to show the before and the after, what those changing times meant in the lives of ordinary people. It's no accident, I think, that so many American writers are products of small towns. I'm thinking of William Maxwell and Flannery O'Connor, John O'Hara, Joyce Carol Oates. Faulkner spent his whole career writing about Oxford, Mississippi and the surrounding countryside. All those brilliant novels, Light in August and As I Lay Dying and The Sound and the Fury, they're all set in this fictional small town of Jefferson, the capital of a county Faulkner invented and called Yoknapatafa. As a writer, I understand why he was drawn to this subject and how he got a whole career's worth of material out of that one small town. It's the interconnectedness of people in small towns, the lack of anonymity that make them good subjects for fiction. Here's a true story. When I was 20 years old, I brought my college boyfriend home to Barnesboro to meet my parents. We were about 15 miles away from my parents' house, and I started pointing to different houses along the road and telling him who lives there, her maiden name, the children's names, what grades they're in, what he did for a living, where they went to church, and so on and so on. I thought nothing of this. My brother or any one of my 99 first cousins could have done the same thing, um, but my boyfriend was truly amazed not just at how much I knew about the people in my town, but that I found this stuff interesting. <laughs> he was from a real place. He grew up in a bedroom community in southern Connecticut, and he had cable. So, you know, he didn't have to entertain himself the way kids growing up in small towns did. His parents worked constantly, but they barely knew the names of the people who lived across the street. My boyfriend grew up without the, the rich narrative tradition of living in a small town, or what many people would call gossip. One of the reasons I was so attracted to the 1940s and 50s is that in those days, Western Pennsylvania had a really rich and interesting local culture. Now, those were the days before people got on airplanes, the days before the internet, days before television, and that region was a lot more isolated than it is today. There's a very distinct Western Pennsylvania accent that was much stronger in those days before kids learned to speak by listening to people on television. In those days, people shopped downtown in stores that were locally owned. They listened to polkas on the radio. They ate Irish or Polish or Italian traditional foods at the holidays. 
Today, that culture, those peculiarities that made Western Pennsylvania towns so interesting, has begun to fade. Now people shop at chain stores. They drive to fast food restaurants. They watch the same TV programs as everybody else in America. And I'm afraid that so much of what made that region singular has begun to disappear. Of course, this is not unique to Western Pennsylvania. It's happening all across the country. I've often thought that if somebody blindfolded you and sent you off in a Greyhound bus, and you woke up the next morning, you would have no idea whether you were in Tampa or Tulsa or Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You'd see the same strip malls, the same Burger King and Walmart, regardless of where you landed. What we're seeing today is the death of regionalism. And I think that is a terrible and tragic loss. My feelings on that subject had a lot to do with why I wrote Baker Towers. I wanted to capture that region as it used to be, before the mines declined, before Walmart came in. I wanted to memorialize a way of life that has completely disappeared. It was very satisfying to write about Western Pennsylvania at a time when it was even more Western Pennsylvanian. The years before television and that homogenizing effect on our culture. That's why that period is so appealing to me. At the same time, I didn't want to romanticize things, to present a Hallmark card view of what those years were like in a small town. All the characters in Baker Towers, but the women especially, struggle against the limitations of living in a very small town. The oldest Novak daughter, Dorothy, is a victim of small town gossip. And her sister, Joyce, who is truly gifted and ambitious, struggles to find any kind of meaningful work. In Bakerton, Joyce's ambition is not exactly welcome. When you write about the past, there's a danger of getting sentimental of portraying those times in a distorted way, in, in a way that disregards the difficult parts of that time. I didn't want to do that. For instance, it was impossible for me to write about life in those times without looking at the situation women were in. During the war, women had taken over all sorts of jobs, civilian jobs, defense jobs. They kept the factories running. Some of them even served in the military. And then when the war was over, all that changed overnight. The soldiers came back, they got their jobs back, and women were supposed to go home to raising families doing what they had done before. And of course, some women were very happy about that, but others felt truly discarded and pushed aside. I'm often asked how I went about writing a story that took place so long before I was born. I couldn't rely on my own memories of the war. So I spent a lot of time poking around in libraries, which is something I thoroughly enjoy. I spent a lot of time looking at old newspapers and magazines, not just the headlines, but the advertisements. I wanted to know what people were wearing, what kind of cars they drove, what groceries cost, what was playing on the radio. When I set out to write a scene that took place in June of 1944, the first thing I did was find out what were the Billboard top 20 songs for those weeks? Some of those songs really haunted me. Now, some of that information finds its way into Baker Towers, but most of it didn't. A lot of it was just my way of making those times real for myself, real in my imagination. Some of my most useful research, if you can call it that, happened in the course of conversation, just simply talking to people who had vivid memories of those times. It interested me that even though some very difficult things happened in those years, people remembered them as very good times. That's the impression I always had growing up, which is probably how I developed this strange nostalgia for times I don't even remember. My father, in particular, had a great memory for details. Certain scenes in Baker Towers come directly from his recollections of his boyhood. There's a moment about halfway through the book when George Novak is standing at his mother's grave and remembers, years ago, 
the parish had maintained a funerary band. When his grandmother died, a uniformed trumpeter and drummer and accordionist had followed the hearse to the cemetery, serenading the casket with hymns. No one knew where this custom had originated. In the old country, they all assumed. His mother had found the music comforting, a joyous wave of sound to carry her own mother away. That memory is my father's memory, dating back probably to the 1930s when the mostly Polish kids in his neighborhood used to follow the funeral processions to the Italian cemetery because they liked the music. What a priceless detail that is. You can't make this stuff up. I have an aunt in her 70s now. I was talking about her earlier at dinner. Um, like the character of Dorothy Novak in my book, my aunt had a wartime job in Washington, D.C. And when I talked with her about what that experience was like, she said the most interesting thing. She said, it was a city that was almost entirely empty of men. What she said exactly was, you could go weeks without seeing a man older than 18 or younger than 50. In fact, that sentence appears word for word in Baker Towers. It was amazing to me how with just those few words she made that time come alive for me. These conversations gave me something more valuable than simple facts. They gave me perspective. It was fascinating to note what people remember in their later years when they have the benefit of hindsight, which events in their lives hold the most meaning for them. Last year, I got a letter. It was sent to my publisher. Um, it's a letter written by a gentleman in San Diego whose daughter had given him a copy of Baker Towers. He wrote to me, being a product of that same era, I could relate to much of what you wrote. It's unfortunate that many of us are not wise enough in our journey through life to know when life-changing moments are upon us, nor do we have the wisdom to make the right decisions. Though you are a young person, your story captures beautifully the sweetness of memory I feel at this stage of my life and the pangs of regret. That's from a man named Frank White in San Diego. That letter was so gratifying to me. It let me know that for at least that one reader, the feeling I was trying to convey really did come across. That wistfulness of remembrance, the ruthlessness of time passing. When Baker Towers was first published, um, I was interviewed on the Today Show, which, by the way, was probably the most nerve-wracking experience of my life. And the worst moment was when the host asked me that awful question all fiction writers fear. So, What's your book about? <laughs> now, that sounds straightforward, but it's a really difficult question to answer. Writers are actually terrible judges of what our books are about. Now, if we could articulate that in just a few sentences, we wouldn't have had to write the whole book. <laughs> but because I was forced to think about this on national television yet, I now have an answer to the question. Baker Towers is a book about home. It's about that peculiar hold our childhood environment has on us. All my characters have strong and more or less conflicted feelings about this little town they grow up in. The oldest son, George, is probably the most haunted by this place that he can't seem to leave behind. Serving in the Navy, he gets a glimpse of the larger world and when the war ends, he's determined to leave Bakerton behind at all costs. But he finds it's not so simple. In the course of the book, he goes back to Bakerton and leaves again, and goes back and leaves again. He never quite succeeds in reconciling his love for this place with his restlessness, his need to get away. There's a famous quote. I, I wish I knew who said this. Um, a small town is a greedy enterprise. And I think that is so true. Small towns just don't let go of you. If you're born in one, it gets its hooks into you, and you never really free yourself. Writing this book was my way of exploring that on the page. I want to read to you now a scene from Baker Towers. This one takes place early in the book. Um, 
George Novak, the oldest son, has come back from the war. He has impulsively married a girl from a wealthy family. In this scene, George is bringing his new bride home to Bakerton for the first time to meet his Italian mother, Rose. I should mention that one unique characteristic of the Novaks, at least by Bakerton standards, is that they're a mixed family, Polish and Italian, <laughs> which in Bakerton in the 1940s was a pretty revolutionary thing. So anyway, here's Baker Towers. George and his new bride drove into Bakerton in a 48 Chevy Fleet Line sedan, a wedding gift from Marion's father. They'd been driving for seven hours, the last two on a narrow country road that wound north, more or less, from the highway. That's impossible, she said when he told her how long it would take, but his estimate, allowing for dirt roads and rugged hills, farm equipment and sluggish coal trucks, turned out to be correct. Almost there, he said. It's just over this hill. He accelerated and was rewarded by an exquisite sound, the mellifluous roar of the ten-cylinder engine. At the top of Saxon Mountain, he slowed, looking down on the town, the bustling Main Street with its six traffic lights, the eight church steeples, the railroad tracks that cut the valley in half. From this vantage point, you could see all of Saxon Valley, Polish Hill, the old mine camp known as Swede Town, the number five tipple just beyond. Baker Towers loomed above the train tracks. Behind them, rows of identical shingled roofs. If Marion had asked, George would have told her what they were. Bony piles, company houses. But his wife, bless her, did not. He rolled down his window. It was a clear Saturday in late June. At every church in Bakerton, someone was getting married. A warm breeze blew up from the valley, carrying the sound of bells. A riot of bells circling and discordant. The stately chime at St. John's Episcopal, the twelve tones of the Angelus, the soaring refrain of Ave Maria. George had heard these bells his whole life. Each set was distinct, recognizable, its voice as familiar as a relative's. Home, he thought. They drove through the town. Bridesmaids posed on the steps of St. Bridget's, waiting to be photographed. A full parking lot at St. Casimir's, Ford's and Oldsmobile's decorated with tissue paper flowers. A gasping Studebaker idled out front, a string of empty beer cans trailing from its bumper. My goodness, said Marion, removing her dark sunglasses. She was unaccustomed to early mornings. The skin beneath her eyes looked slightly blue. What is that all about? <laughs> Ma, they hang a lot of junk on the groom's car, George said. When they drive away, it makes a real racket. She smiled uncertainly. Is that a Polish tradition? A Bakerton tradition, George grinned. Aren't you sorry we missed out on that? He took the long way through town, imagined the sun glinting off the Chevy's chrome bumpers. They crossed the railroad tracks and climbed Polish Hill. A barefoot boy ran in the street. The Pablucki's chickens pecked quietly at the front yard. Fingering her rosary, Mrs. Stusick rocked back and forth on her porch swing, a babushka tied under her chin. The houses are all the same, Marion observed. Company houses, said George. There, he thought, that wasn't so bad. He pulled in front of his mother's house and engaged the brake. I hope they like me, she said. Ah, they'll love you, said George, who had loved her the moment he saw her. How could they not? They'd met at Thanksgiving at her parents' house in Haverford, a wealthy suburb on Philadelphia's main line. George had been invited by her brother, Kip Quigley, whom he knew from a chemistry class at Temple. Quigley had hired George as his tutor, which meant that he sat behind George during exams and copied with impunity from his paper. George dressed carefully for dinner, pressed trousers, his only sport coat. He knew that Quigley came from money. Quigley's department store was a Philadelphia institution. George had never bought anything there himself. The prices were too steep. But he passed the store each day on his way home from the bus stop, stepping around well-dressed matrons with their green and white shopping bags. 
He saw Quigley's bags all over the city, miles from the actual store. Merely carrying such a bag seemed to be a status symbol. That alone should have tipped him off. The opulence of the house astonished him. Seated between two elderly aunts, he tried to be sociable, but was flummoxed by the many forks and glasses. The Quigleys had invited a crowd. George counted 16 heads at the long table, not including the woman who came to serve each course. At the far end, Marion sat with her chin in her hand, leaning on her elbow, violating everything George had been taught about table manners. She seemed to feel his gaze. She looked directly at him and tipped one eyebrow, a skill he admired. Then she drained her wine glass in a single gulp. After dinner, George took Kip aside. Who's that, he said, in the blue. My sister, I'd introduce you, but I like you too much. Ah, come on, George said, laughing. Oh, you'll see, don't say I didn't warn you. When the guests moved to the living room, George spotted Marion alone on a sofa and introduced himself. Marion Baumgardner, she said, offering her hand. He paused for a moment, confused, a sick feeling in his stomach. She was married. The intensity of his disappointment surprised him. You're a friend of my brother's, she asked. Yeah, we're in a class together. I suppose I can't hold that against you. He laughed uncertainly. Ah, Kip's all right. I think he's an ass. She leaned forward and took a cigarette from a case on the table. Her hand was long and white, slender as a fish. Where were you stationed, she asked. He grinned. How'd you know I was a vet? She shrugged languidly as if to ask what else he could possibly be. In the South Pacific, he said. I was a medic on a minesweeper. He leaned over to light her cigarette. When she raised her hand, he saw that she wore no wedding ring. She seemed to read his mind. I'm a widow, she said. My husband was a paratrooper. His glider was shot down over Sicily. Her voice was flat, her face still as a mask. So tell me, George, what brings you to this part of the world? You're not from here. It wasn't a question. Is it that obvious, he wondered? You gotta be somewhere, he said. She seemed amused when he asked for her phone number, but gave it to him anyway. When he called her the very next night, she invited him to her apartment. She lived alone on the top floor of a brick row house off Rittenhouse Square, a grand place with 12-foot ceilings. One room held a wide bed, the only furniture she seemed to own. In the living room were an easel and several unfinished canvases, bright colors in jagged patterns that seemed perfectly random, like the scrawlings of an angry child. The place smelled of coffee and turpentine. The refrigerator held tonic water, vodka, and gin. Their first date lasted the entire weekend. George emerged from her apartment on a Sunday afternoon, exhilarated and slightly queasy. He hadn't eaten and his temples ached with hangover. Her paint-dappled rug had left a crisscross pattern on his back. She was more experienced than he, a fact apparent to them both. She did things to him no girl had done and made it clear with words and gestures that he was to reciprocate. Her frankness shocked him. He hadn't inspected a virgin, yet she had lived with her husband only a month. If she'd had other lovers, she never mentioned them, and for this George was grateful. He proposed after three months. Her father took the news calmly. He gave up on me long ago, Marion had told George, when I ran off and married a Jew. Novak, said the old man, what kind of name is that? Polish, sir. My father came over from Poland. Quigley raised his bushy eyebrows. A lot of Jews came from Poland. My family's Catholic, sir. George knew from Marion this wouldn't be welcome news either, but her father took it stoically. In the end, he even gave his blessing, and Marion Baumgardner became Marion Novak, one youthful indiscretion expunged by another, slightly less egregious one. They were married that spring in a quiet ceremony at the Quigley's church in Haverford. George's family did not attend. He didn't tell his mother until afterward. 
She would have insisted on a Catholic wedding, and that was a conversation George didn't wish to have. Later, this would seem a cowardly decision, but at the time, he deemed it practical. To him, one church was as good as another. Any sort of ceremony would suffice as long as it made Marion his wife. His little sister greeted them as they climbed the porch steps. Hi, Georgie, she said shyly, peering through the screen door. She was four years old, timid with strangers. Hey, honey, he opened the door and lifted her into his arms. In she a doll, my baby sister Lucy. He was prepared to hand her over so Marion could hold her, but his wife only smiled. He put Lucy down and went inside. Hello, he called, heading for the kitchen. His mother stood at the sink rinsing dishes. He was relieved to see that she was wearing shoes. Not only that, she'd put on lipstick. It was the first time in years he'd seen her without an apron. He embraced her. She was stouter than he remembered. Her hair smelled of garlic. A wonderful aroma filled the kitchen, a strawberry pie cooling on the windowsill. Mama, this is Marion. How do you do? Marion offered her hand. Next to Rose, she looked slim as a whippet, tall and elegant in her pale blue suit. Pleased to meet you, Rose said carefully as though she had rehearsed it. They sat. His mother took plates from the cupboard and set about slicing the pie. Mama, come sit down. In a minute, first I make coffee. She bustled about the kitchen, putting on water, measuring the grounds. Marion glanced around the room. Is that a coal stove? She studied it with naked fascination, as though she'd never seen such a thing. It occurred to him that she probably hadn't. The stove, the last supper hanging on the wall, the Lenten palm leaves tucked behind it to ward off lightning strikes. All the familiar objects of his childhood were curiosities to her. Where does it go, the coal? He indicated the compartment at the side of the stove. <coughs> you fill it every day? Every few hours, said George. Depends on how much cooking you do. That was my job when I was a kid, fill in the coal bucket. Well, who fills it now? Sandy, I guess, my little brother. Mama, where is he? Outside some place. I don't know. Me, I never know. She spoke softly as if not wanting to intrude on their conversation. She brought cups and saucers to the table. Mama, please sit down. He regretted the edge in his voice. He only wanted her to sit and talk like a regular person instead of behaving like a waitress. Finally, she did sit, hands folded in her lap. Smells delicious in here, said Marion. I've been cooking all day. Rose's eyes met Marion's. You like to cook? Marion laughed, a low, bubbling sound. Oh, heavens no, I'm a disaster in the kitchen. George is still teaching me to fry an egg. Rose frowned. What you eat then? Oh, I don't know. Marion crossed and uncrossed her long legs. We go to restaurants or make sandwiches. I don't have much of an appetite. George avoided his mother's gaze. He knew what she was thinking. What kind of girl you marry? She don't know how to fry an egg. You still working, Georgie? Rose asked. With the hardware? Nah, I quit that job. I'm working for Marion's dad now. He has a store. What about the school? I'm taking the summer off, he said. Mrs. Novak, said Marion, George tells me your family's Italian. Rose looked down at her lap, smoothed the fabric of her dress over her knees. Yeah, that's right. We come over when I was little. Marion leaned forward in her chair, smiling warmly. Have you ever considered going back? Rose glanced uncertainly at George, confusion written on her face. Your wife, she want to send me back. <laughs> oh, what for? she asked. Oh, just for a visit. Again, Marion smiled. She was not a smiler by nature. George could sense her effort. It's a different world since the war. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, to see how things have changed? The way of life, the political situation. Her voice trailed off. 
No, me, I got nobody there. Rose stood and dipped a dishcloth in the sink. She wrung it out and passed it over the counter. My grandparents lost touch with their folks when they left, George explained. Oh, that's too bad. Marion stirred her coffee, though she hadn't actually added any sugar. I'd like to go one day. My husband died there during the war. George felt his face warm. Your husband, his mother repeated. Oh, George didn't tell you. I'm a widow. No, he don't tell me. Again, Rose wiped at the counter with the rag. A long silence in which Marion sipped her coffee. George swallowed bite after bite of strawberry pie, which seemed to be piling up on the way to his stomach. Finally, Marion got to her feet. Would you mind if I lay down for a while? She asked. I've got a bit of a headache. George led her upstairs to his sister's bedroom where they would be sleeping. The room was immaculate, the walls bare. When he'd last visited, a poster had hung above the bed. It had been removed for their visit and replaced with a crucifix. You shouldn't have told her that, said George. Told her what? That you were married before. She stared at him. I assumed she already knew. Well, why would I tell her a thing like that? Well, because it's true. It's what happened, Marion frowned. Should I be ashamed of it? Nah, of course not, George said hastily. He couldn't bring himself to explain it, that his mother had expected what every mother expected, for her son to marry a virgin, sweet and uncomplicated, an altogether different sort of girl. Mama's old-fashioned, that's all. It's hard enough for her getting used to a daughter-in-law. Marion shrugged as if the matter were hardly worth discussing. I'm exhausted, she said, stripping down to her panties. He watched her undress. Her casual nudity still startled him. Her habit was to sleep late, skim the newspaper, and paint for an hour or two, all without putting on a stitch of clothing. In their own apartment, with the shades drawn, it excited him, but here in his mother's house it seemed very wrong. What's the matter? said Marion. Eh, nothing. The truth, that he wished she'd put some clothes on, seemed foolish and neurotic. Marion certainly would have thought so. She climbed under the covers and rolled onto her side. I won't sleep, she said. I'll just close my eyes. That's Baker Towers. Thank you. All right, now, you've had quite some time to think about this, so somebody please ask a question. Yes. Well, you've lived in this world of Baker Towers, and now you're going to leave it. Is mm -hmm. that going to be hard for you, or, or has it been, um, to, to venture out into new territory? No, it never is. Um, I finished this book quite a while back, and um, the hardest thing for me is not so much leaving the book I've been working on, but being without a book. You know, I think of, um, I'm a short story writer also, and I, I think the difference between writing short stories and novels is the difference between dating and a long, bad marriage. You know. <laughs> um, with a short story, you know, there's a certain element of novelty, and if it isn't working out, you toss it. It's not that big a deal. A novel is something else entirely. It's, um, it's a day in, day out, kind of endeavor where you are living with the mistakes you made yesterday, last week, last month, last year. They're cumulative mistakes and they sort of um, circumscribe the shape of your life as in a long bad marriage. Um, however, even when a novel is going badly, to me it is preferable to not having a novel. It's sort of the devil you know. Um, I go through a lot of anguish in between books because I don't have a sense of purpose. It occurs to me that, gosh, people who don't write must have a lot more time than I do because it's not that writing takes up so much time, it's the anguish about writing that takes up so much time. When you take that out of a life, it's sort of a, an empty vessel for a good long time. So in between finishing Baker Towers and starting my new book, I had um, oh, six, more than six months, closer to a year of um, 
emptiness and anguish. And uh, in that time, I um, thought about a lot of other characters. I tried on different ideas, but nothing really caught. And until something did, I was really uh, pretty miserable. So um, as painful as writing something, as writing can sometimes be, to me it's not as painful as not writing anything. I am extraordinarily superstitious about talking about works in progress um, while I'm doing the first draft. The first draft for me takes a couple of years maybe, and in that time even my editor doesn't know what I'm working on, um, which says a great deal about my editor. I'm, I'm really lucky to um, have found a wonderful editor who indulges me in this respect and um, doesn't ask questions. When I was working on Baker Towers, she um, she called me after about two years after I started the book, and she said, okay, Jen, no pressure. Just tell me what year might we publish this. It's the only question she ever asked. She had no idea what the book was about, nothing. And she gave me an awful lot of time and space to do the work I needed to do. Um, my new book is uh, just coming out of the first draft stage. Um, I'm just reaching a stage where um, I've allowed my reader to take a look at it. I have one reader. Uh, who's also a novelist, who reads all my work, all my short stories, um, you know, first drafts of a novel, all of that. And he's just gotten his first look at my new book two years into the project. So um, it's maybe a little bit premature to talk about it, but I will say it is yet another family story. That seems to me the story I'm going to write again and again and again and again until I die is the family story. Um, of course, it's a different family. It takes place... Um, you know, in a, in a different location. It's, it actually takes place in the Boston area, which is different. Um, and um, it's, it's about the difficulty of um, coexisting with people you love very much but didn't choose, which is sort of, you know, what family is for a lot of us. Um, so that's what it's about. Um, it's about a family with grown children. Yes? Well, um, the minds mean something very specific to each member of the family. Um, for all of them, the minds are, you know, the thing that took away their father. Um, I'm not giving anything away by saying that in the very first chapter of the book, the father of this family has just died, and he's died of a uh, heart attack related to black lung disease. So it's very much a mining death. He didn't die in a mining accident, but his death was absolutely caused by coal mining. Um, so that's where the book begins. You have um, a widowed mother of five, and uh, you know, with a, with an infant and four older children, and for each member of that family, the minds are forever tied to the loss of, of the the husband and father. So there's that. Um, for George, the oldest son, who you met in the the scene I just read, um, the minds are the thing he's been running away from. All his boyhood friends have gone on to become coal miners, including his closest friend. Um, and every time he comes back to Bagerton to visit, he gets a look at that life that he has run away from. Um, so, you know, he was the, the member of the family who um, stood in line to uh, become a coal miner, and he opted out of it. Um, so, yeah, I do go down into the mines at one point rather late in the book. I don't want to give away too much, but um, there is a chapter that deals more directly with the mines. Um, if you've ever been inside a coal mine, it's a really, uh, it's an unforgettable experience. It's a, it's a kind of darkness that I've never experienced anywhere else. I sometimes think about my grandfathers eating lunch on their shifts. You're still down there, you know? You're down there for the whole 10 hours. It was 10, then it was, um, later it became an eight hour shift. But when my grandfather started out in the mine, it was a 10 hour shift. And uh, yeah, it's a long time to be in the dark. I did, and I do. Um, my mother still lives there, so I, I do go back now and again, uh, probably a couple of times a year. And, um, you know, it was very interesting for me. I started writing the book 
when I was living in Iowa, I just I was still in the Iowa Writers Workshop. I just published Mrs. Kimball, or I just finished Mrs. Kimball, and um, I was started writing the book from a bit of a distance. But you know, that landscape is so familiar to me. If I close my eyes, I can see it right in front of me right now. You know, I mean, I I can remember exactly what the bricks look like on the brick streets. It when you spend your whole childhood in a place, it really is an indelible thing. Um, so I was writing from memory. Um, but I did go back uh, periodically while I was working on the book. And I've gone back many times since and talked with lots and lots of people from my town who've read the book, which has been a pretty fantastic experience. Um, so yeah, you know, it's a, it's a place I'll always go back to. Yeah. It's really tricky. Um, I feel fortunate in the sense that I don't have an autobiographical instinct in any way. In fact, it pains me to write about my own experience. And a couple times, um, I've taken on assignments to write personal essays and choked. I, I couldn't make the deadline. I couldn't write the essay. Um, it is really not in my nature to write about myself. So um, I think in some ways, it saves me in a certain sense. Um, I do much better with invented characters than with um, characters taken from life. Um, I, I have many friends who are fiction writers who, feel, who have just the opposite experience and their most vivid stories come from their own lives and the lives of people close to them. I've never been able to do that. Um, it's probably been sort of a, a privacy instinct on my part. I have a hard time writing about myself and people close to me. Um, but also I feel bound by the truth in a way that is so inconvenient. You know, I really, um, it's, I think that's why many of us do write fiction, because we don't want to be bound by the truth. Um, it's so limiting, isn't it, having to tell the truth. Um, I like to think that in fiction you're, um, you're working toward a kind of truth that is maybe not, um, it's not a, a factual kind of accuracy, but it's a larger kind of truth. I don't know if that answers your question. But. It is, yes. Yes. I read that you did write uh, stories, mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to find a book of your short stories. Is there a reason for this? Yes, there is. It's that one has not been published. <laughs> um, I do. I do have one in the editorial pipeline. I have mostly finished the manuscript. It's with my publisher. Um, the, the holdup, really, is that I keep feeling like I want to write one more story. I'm not done yet. There's one more story I need to write. And I've been saying that for two years now. So um, it's unclear to me when I'm going to be able to just let go of that manuscript and, and let them publish it as it is. Um, it's, uh, I love writing short stories, but I do find them very challenging. And they take me a really long time. Um, a short story takes me about half as long as a novel does. And short stories, you know, 20, 30 pages. Um, so a, I find it to be kind of an unforgiving form. Um, I teach a short story writing workshop at BU. And, um, you know, I, I'm so aware of the, uh, how easy it is to screw these things up. You know, in a novel, if, think about it. If a novel's well written, if you like the style, if the characters are great, and you'll sort of hang in there with the writer. Even if the writer digresses a little bit, there's a chapter that doesn't really excite you, if you're halfway into the book, you'll hang in there because you're engaged. Not so in a short story. If the writer screws up one scene, you blew it, you know? The short story is not, it cannot hold too many wrong turns. It's just a less forgiving form. I suppose a, a poem is the least forgiving form, where if, you, if a word is glaringly wrong, it's all over, you blew the poem. Um, but a, a novel you know, allows you to uh, uh, digress a little bit and wander a bit and, and even make a few mistakes and can still be a very good novel. Um, so anyway, that's why you haven't found a book of short stories. A few of them can be found online. Um, if you Google my name, a few of them will come up. I, I publish them now and again in literary journals. Maybe once a year I'll publish one. I've been writing them for a good long time, and uh, sooner or later that collection will come out. I'm, I'm thinking maybe in 2008. Possibly it will come out in 2008, but who knows? Yeah. Do you have time to read other novels uh, that you write and other writers? If so, who do you write? 
Um, I don't read. I don't read many contemporary novels for the simple fact that when I'm in the composition stage, the first two years of a book, I'm writing a first draft. Um, I have to be very careful when I'm reading because I find myself unconsciously aping the style of the writer I'm reading. Now, sometimes that really improves my style, and it's a very good thing, but then that chapter isn't going to match the rest of the book. Um, so when I'm composing a novel, I read more poetry, I read more nonfiction, I can read in French, I can read 19th century writers. None of those things will um, get into my head the way a contemporary novel will. So now that I'm finishing my first draft, I'm just finally getting to the point where I can start reading contemporary fiction again. And I'm so excited. I can't wait. I so look forward to this stage. So maybe you have some recommendations for me because I've been out of the loop for two years. Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm so monogamous in my work habits. I just, I, I can only hold one idea in my head at a time. And a novel is so consuming for me that I simply don't get ideas for other things. I don't get an idea for another novel that I'm tempted to go off and write, or I don't get an idea for a short story. It doesn't happen, you know? But um, that's why when I finish a novel, I sometimes have the feeling that every thought I've ever had is in this book. I mean, seriously, there's not a stray impulse from the last three years that didn't somehow make it onto the page. Um, I do sometimes write a short story in between drafts of a novel. That can be helpful. When I finish a draft, I need to put it down for at least a month, and longer is better. So um, in that time, I may um, roll up my sleeves and write a short story. And when I do, I really enjoy it. It's so much fun. Yes. I'm just curious. I don't know if this is about dating, but have you always liked your reader? It, do you choose who your reader is when, when you? Who I'm writing for, yes. who I'm writing the story to? Yes. You know what? I don't. And it's a strange thing. Um, I don't know if this is typical of writers, but if I think of anybody reading my book, I will be paralyzed. I have to write in the belief that nobody will ever read it. In the way you'd write in your journal, you know, that kind of. It's, um, I actually expend a great deal of energy trying to block out the idea that anybody's ever going to read this book. If I think about my mother reading my book, I'll just stop forever, you know? I, I can't allow myself to think about it, let alone think about reviewers or think about my editor or anything like that. I really block it all out. I just have to. Um, gosh, writing is hard enough. Even just writing for myself is hard enough, you know? Um, so I, I, I don't even think about it. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking about the structure of the two um, different novels, Mrs. Kimball and uh, Baker Towers. And do you, they're very different structures. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kimball, um, one wife picks up where the other, the, the narration or omniscience of one uh, wife picks up where the other leaves off. And Baker Towers is a very different book mm -hmm. and a very different structure. Uh, and I'm wondering if character comes to you first or if the structure comes to you first. It seems to maybe that Mrs. Kimball is more, more about that structure. It's interesting, you know? There's, there's very little logic to it. Um, for those who don't know it, uh, Mrs. Kimball, my first book, is a novel in three parts. It's kind of a triptych. It's told from the point of view of the first wife, second wife, and then third wife of the same man. So you're seeing these marriages through the eyes of these three different women, and you're seeing the husband through the eyes of these three different women. In different decades. Right, in different decades, over time. Um, Baker Towers has um, an entirely different structure where you have many different characters' points of view. Uh, you have much longer chapters. Um, Mrs. Kimball has lots of very short scenes, short chapters. It goes from scene to scene rather quickly. Um, Actually, in Mrs. Kimball, the structure was the last thing that came to me. Uh, the first year I was writing Mrs. Kimball, I thought I was writing a totally different book. Um, I thought the whole book would be about that first wife, Bertie, and her children. I had no idea that there would be a Mr. Kimball, that there would be a second wife, there would be a third wife. What happens to me a lot when I'm writing is um, I start out with an idea for a story. I start writing it. And invariably, I find my attention hijacked by some other peripheral part of the story. Some minor character becomes intriguing to me, and the whole focus of the thing shifts. 
So as hard as I might try to plan on the front end what the structure will be, it always ends up taking a turn. Um, and actually, my current novel has a very different structure again. Um, Mrs. Kimball has the tiny, short little chapters. Some of them are you know, three pages long. Um, in my new novel, all the chapters are 70 pages long, and there are just a few of them. You know, I find that every story needs to be written differently, and that's, that's part of what is very difficult in beginning a novel, is that you are making those discoveries, and you know, you gotta kiss a lot of toads. I mean, I, I structure them wrong, and then I structure them wrong in a different way, and then a different way, and then a different way, and um, I just sort of air my way into the structure of the book. The editor never changes what I write. What she does do is um, read the manuscript and um, mark it up, ask questions. She queries me, essentially. She gives me um, suggestions. I can take them or leave them, pretty much. Um, now, my editor is very, very smart, and she's been doing this a lot longer than I have. And I take her suggestions very seriously, and I do end up using many of them. But if I think her impulse is wrong, um, you know, I don't follow it, and it's not a problem. Um, she's been working with fiction writers for a very long time, and she understands that, you know, ultimately, it's my name on the book. And um, sometimes I refuse her advice, and I'm probably wrong, but it's sort of my mistake to make. Um, so it's, it's, you know, for better or for worse, it's pretty much um, all my fault. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.